Good morning, everyone, and I want to say happy Sabbath for those of you that are joining us live. And for those of you that are joining us later, good afternoon or good evening. Uh, my name is John Romatera, and I am the pastor of the Lake Cumberland District in the Kentucky Tennessee Conference, representing the Danville Grove and Somerset churches in this area. I want to say a special greetings to uh, those who haven't joined us before and to my members. Thank you for joining us. I realize that we have been on this journey together ever since the quarantine, and I know that God has definitely been blessing us even when we aren't able to see each other in person. And if this is your first time joining us, uh, go ahead and drop a comment and let us know where you're joining us from. Wherever in the world, we'd love to know uh, where you're connecting with us from. And if you're joining us, you're part of the family, and I want to say welcome and God bless you. Uh, before we get into the message today, let us say a prayer together. And feel free to add any comments or if you have any praises and requests that come to mind as you are listening to this message this after or this morning, uh, go ahead and, and let them uh, put them in the comment box so that we can pray over them and uh, celebrate with you. Uh, but let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us all here together gathered this morning or if they watch this later on lord wherever whatever time whatever place lord we're, we're grateful that we have you that we have your word and we pray lord that your holy spirit will lead and guide us as we get into our study today we pray these things in jesus name amen you ever find yourself feeling nostalgic like you ever find yourself just sitting back and maybe a song uh, or a movie or, or something just just pricks at your memory and makes you just sit back and and reflect on the good old days the good old days things were so much better back then uh, I gotta tell you every time uh, a movie is remade or a song cover is is made of one of my favorite songs it's just like man this just takes me back nostalgia is a very real thing and I've noticed that especially recently we we keep talking about uh, not just the good old days but we attribute the good old days to four months ago uh, four months ago before uh, corona BC we were able to not go around to places without having to worry about uh, viruses we didn't have to wear a facial ma uh, a mask uh, we didn't have to do social distancing. Uh, BC, uh, the good old days when we could travel and not be afraid of, of getting infected, at least to the degree that we have now. And, and even when it comes to the way that we church, the way that we do church, I, I know a lot of people that are just aching to go back to the good old days, to what it was before. And some, some Christians, some brothers and sisters in the faith are actually doing just that. They are sitting and waiting for things to go back to how it was. But what if things don't go back the way that it was pre-COVID? What if those good old days are not going to come back? Do you find yourself stuck? Do you find yourself unwilling to move forward or, or envision something different because you find yourself so nostalgic that you find yourself just waiting for the good old days to come back and staying there? What if I were to tell you that God does not want us to look longingly to the past? What if I were to tell you that God doesn't want us to... Uh, to, to look back in the past and just say, oh man, it was so much better. I wish I could go back then. What if I were to tell you that that kind of mentality keeps us from moving to whatever next that God has for in store for us, that, has, that God has in store for you and for me? What if God wants us to leave the past in order for us to move forward into the next. And that's where I want to explore with you today. 
we have been doing a series entitled Next. And God had inspired me, God had inspired me to do a sermon series called Next because I, I, I was, I, I've been wrestling with this question myself. God, what's next? What's next? Uh, 2020 was supposed to be my year, but it just didn't turn out that way. Uh, what's next? Uh, another virus? Uh, another calamity? God, what's next? What's next for me? What's next for for the church? What's next in the future? God, please tell me what's next. I don't know about you, but that that has uh, been a microcosm of of my thought process. And God has spoken to me in in the in the midst of me asking these questions. And last week, we talked about how God wants to prepare us for whatever is next by shaping our now. And we discussed how God wanted to teach His disciples, those that call Him by, that call themselves His disciples, those that are following Him, not just to get into the boat, but to cross over. And in the midst of that crossing over, we find ourselves wrestling with the storms in life. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm going through some storms in my own life. And I often find myself forgetting that God is in the midst of it. That God isn't in control. But He is. He's right there in the middle. He may not be saying much, but He's present. And He wants us to have faith in Him. God is building our faith and trust in the now to prepare us for the next. I want to explore with you this next part of our series called Leave the Shore. Leave the Shore. When we talk about leaving the shore, I'd like to challenge us with this first point. In order for us to get to the next whatever that next is, not only do we have to get into the boat, we also have to be willing to leave the shore. Leave the shore. Now, what on earth does that mean? I want to take us to our passage for study today, and it is found in the book of Luke, chapter 9, starting in verse 57. And this is what it says. As they were going along the road, someone had said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. (laughs) I want you to notice, I just want you to see how the scene is being set up here. We see here that that as Jesus and his disciples are preparing to get into the boat, uh, someone comes up to him and says, I will follow you wherever you go. I love the enthusiasm. I wish that we could have people with that same kind of enthusiasm in our churches today saying, Lord, I, I want to follow you wherever you go. Love the enthusiasm. Love the energy. I just, I love, I love it. But following Jesus requires more than just enthusiasm. It requires more than just energy. And I want you to notice what Jesus says here. Jesus says, and, and Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds have air of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Well, that's not exactly the kind of response that I'd be expecting. When I come down for the altar call and I tell Jesus that I'm going to follow him all the days of my life, I'm, I'm invested, I have the energy, I'm determined. But as we unpack the cultural concepts here in this culture. When someone says that he's going to follow another, this is talking about a a rabbi student or rather a a teacher student relationship. And back then it was it was the thing for for young Jewish men to attach themselves to a popular rabbi. Yes, to to learn what they are teaching, but rabbis also enjoyed a special status in society. Uh, they were, they, they had, um, they were, for example, Jesus, even though he was that rabbi that everybody kind of didn't agree with, he still was invited to places to eat. He still was afforded some kind of honor. But the, but this, but this young man coming up to Jesus saying, I'm going to follow you. I'm sure that by attaching himself to a popular teacher, he also would be able to experience the benefits of following a rabbi as popular as Jesus. 
And in Jesus' response, he tells him, look, if you're going to follow me, the kind of discipleship that I'm looking for is more than what you are thinking. If you follow me, you're going to have to elevate your concept of discipleship. When Jesus calls us to follow him, Jesus is more than just a teacher. Jesus is more than just someone that speaks good advice and some wisdom that makes you feel good about yourself. Jesus is actually calling us to follow him in a way that uh, is almost as if we're following a prophet, someone that speaks truth to power, someone that uh, that is not generally welcome, someone that is is essentially somebody that has to say things that people don't like to hear. Someone that is not part of the establishment. Someone that's not in the comfortable. Someone that's not uh, going to bring a claim. And so when Jesus says foxes have holes and, and birds of the air have nests, he's essentially saying, look, I, I don't have a permanent place. I go where I'm led to go. And that may strike some of us here as a little extreme because we don't, really think that way when we think about following jesus we think about okay i'm going to go to church i'm going to read my bible i'm going to pray i'm going to do the kind of discipleship that jesus is calling us to is more than just the comfortable following jesus actually calls us from comfort to discomfort because of what god has called us to do caught what god has called us to preach we don't know what this, how this man responds. We just know that it's up for interpretation. We don't know if he takes Jesus at his word or if he finds another master or rather another rabbi who was less controversial than Jesus. And as we continue, as we continue to the next verse, we see that there was another person that Jesus engaged with in conversation. Only this time, Jesus actually approaches this person and actually says, follow me. But, but he, this is the man that he's talking to, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow, that's harsh. Considering that Considering that, of course, you would want to be able to honor uh, your father if he had died, but there's no indication in this text that his father was already dead. Jesus here is not saying that burying his father was not important. But understand this, we're talking about what it means to follow Jesus. The previous conversation taught us that following Jesus is going to pull us out of our comfort. It's going to essentially uh, make life not as predictable. We're going to have to deal with that tension of unknowing where God is going to lead us next. And we see here that Jesus is also challenging this person. This person probably is already in the crowd, but Jesus then speaks to this person and says, follow me. You may think that just because you're going to church and because you're part of the crowd that that's enough for you to be following Jesus. But Jesus is speaking to you, speaking to me today and asking you and me, follow me. And instead of having the enthusiasm of the first person, we see instead that this, this person responds, well, uh, let me first go and bury my father. To which Jesus then says, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Jesus isn't being insensitive here. Jesus says other phrases like, if you hate your mother and father, or rather love your mother and father more than you love me, then you're not worthy of me. He's saying, he's not saying dishonor your family. He's saying that your priority has to be following me. And sometimes we have our priorities mixed up. It's easy to follow Jesus when things are all good and when things are going well in your job and school and your own personal life it's a completely other concept a completely different picture when you are living in uncertain times 
when you are uncertain about this or that. Jesus is saying your priority has to be me over everything else. And I wonder, friend of mine, have you made Jesus your priority? Or are you satisfied with just being in the crowd, following Jesus, but not really investing fully in following him? So we see Jesus, the passage continues, Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. And so we see on the heels of this, of the second conversation, we see that this person comes to Jesus and essentially kind of says the same thing as the last person. He says, look, I want to follow you. I will follow you, Lord. But first, first let me say farewell to those at my home. Seems like a reasonable request. Look, let me just go home, say goodbye to them, and then I'm going to follow you. Again, we see here that Jesus responds, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. What on earth is Jesus talking about here? focus. Jesus here is trying to address this need or this desire to go back to what is familiar, to go back and and take your time to say farewell to the past. Sometimes when we try to say goodbye to the past, we stay there. And Jesus is saying, no, your face is Your gaze needs to be forward in following me. See, what Jesus is really trying to get at here, he's trying to address this this mindset and this unfortunate uh, practice that we often do. And we see this in throughout the Bible of our of our tendency to look back. We, we, see, we can take uh, Lot's wife, for example. God was trying to lead them out of Sodom and Gomorrah. God was trying to, to lead them to the next, to get them out of that place. But, but Lot's wife looked back, and we know what happened with her. The children of Israel, even though God had freed them from slavery in Egypt, 400 years of slavery in Egypt, from back-breaking work, building cities for an oppressive nation, uh, being, being killed and, and having their children thrown out and killed in order to inhibit their growth and all manner of abuses. We see a people that God had freed miraculously, pulled them out of Egypt himself, led them in the wilderness, and we see... Uh, throughout scripture that these children of Israel, people that had seen the miracles with their very eyes, constantly looking back, and they would say, it would be better that we were in Egypt. It would be better that we were slaves as opposed to dying here in the wilderness. Why is it that we often hold on to an idealistic past that never existed? And I wonder, brothers and sisters, if you and I, would be considered nostalgic Christians. Now, I'm not saying don't appreciate the past, but are we stuck in the past to the point where we can't move forward? We don't want to move forward. We would rather go back than go forward. Instead of going to the next, we want to go back to what is past. And I have to ask this question because I often am confronted with people saying, oh, It was so much easier back then. It was so much better back then. And the question and the challenge that I have for those of you that are watching this is, was it really better back then? Was it really better back then? And I'm talking from the perspective of church. I'm talking from the perspective of people of faith. Was it really better back then? Was there such thing as a golden age of Christianity? Okay, some of you say, yes, there was. Well, let's go back and and look at some examples. First century Christianity, where we often extol the early church for how it grew and was rapid and so many people came into the faith, but was it really all good? You still had racial tensions. Peter 
did not want to go to the Gentiles to preach the gospel until God gave him a vision. We saw early division in the church. We saw racism and classism. And we saw all manner of conflicts that the Apostle Paul had to write these letters to this church and that church trying to quell uh, fighting amongst the people. You had the Jewish and, and Gentile divide and, and, and Paul saying, look, we are all one blood. We're all together. Was that the ideal past? When we look at the time of the church fathers, we see that there was variances of opinion, bishops fighting other bishops. Read the letters of all these heresies that they had to address. Was that your golden age of Christianity? Uh, when 4th century, 4th century on, when Constantine reforms and to the dark ages where you had a church that was uh, church and state together that was oppressive, that was repressive, and we saw all manner of horrible things happen Crusades, the Inquisition. Is that the golden age of, of Christianity? Let's move it a little bit forward when we talk about uh, the, the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther uh, knighting the, uh, knocking or rather um, nailing the 95 theses on the, on the walls of Wittenberg and, and sparking the, the, the Reformation. Was that the golden age of Christianity? where we saw reformers fighting reformers, reformers fighting against the Catholics, and all manner of bloodshed because of what denomination that they were part of. Is that the golden age of Christianity? Let's move it a little bit closer to home to my Adventist family. When we go back to 1888, when it was righteousness by faith versus, versus legalism, you would think that righteousness by faith, that how we are not justified by anything that we can do, it is only our faith in Jesus Christ and what He did that leads us to be justified. We do know that righteousness by faith did not win. Legalism won out. And Ellen White, who we consider our prophet, was exiled to Australia. Is that the golden age of our faith? And let's talk about four months ago where we often are saying, I wish we could go back to four months ago when things were normal. Was that really normal? I mean, think about it. Four months ago, we still had declining churches in North America, all across all denominational levels. We still saw young people leaving the church. We saw church buildings close because of their aging population dying. We still had separate conferences that stemmed from unfortunate racism in our past. Is that what you want to go back to? See, our problem is that we often idealize a past that never existed because we're unwilling to engage the tension of the present. I want to take us back. I want to take us back to Luke. Luke, but before that, I want to read this. It's uh, by Trevin Wax in an article called The Mirage of Golden Age Christianity, October 27, 2014. This is what he said. There is no golden age of Christianity in the past. Only an unbroken line of broken sinners saved by the grace of God and empowered to transmit the gospel to the next generation. No golden age of Christianity. We see here that God worked with his people and did good things happen, absolutely. But there were also things that weren't done so well because we're all broken and God works through our brokenness. But God doesn't want us to go back to previous brokenness. He wants us to move forward to the next, past that brokenness. We leave the shore when we have the right view of the past. And that leads us back to our text. Luke 9, 61 through 62. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say where farewell to those at my home. And when Jesus says, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back as fit for the kingdom of God, he's actually referencing the call of the prophet Elijah. The prophet Elijah was depressed and God could only take him so far. So God said, look, I'm going to need you to uh, select your successor. And so Elijah goes to this young man, Elisha, puts his cloak about him. And that was a very telling sign that he was being selected to follow that prophet. 
But Elisha did say, I need to go back and say farewell, and then I'm going to follow you. And in that instance, we actually see Elijah saying, yeah, go ahead. But here's the thing. What Elisha did was that he went home. He slaughtered all of his oxen. He destroyed his plow, meaning that there would be no return to this. He honored his parents. He honored his family. He celebrated the past. But then he left the past behind him. When we have a proper perspective of the past, that will help us in the present to propel us to the next. I am not saying that we forget the past. I actually think we should honor the past. But honoring the past doesn't mean that we have to stay in the past. We can celebrate past victories. We can celebrate past lessons. We can celebrate past achievements. But those things serve to help us in the present. If we have an idealized past where everything was all good, we refrain from talking about the things that weren't so good, the things that God had to lead us out of in order to better us, in order to produce in us a better character in order to prepare us for the next. Elijah had it right. He celebrated his past, but he said, there's no return from this. I'm going to follow Elijah the prophet wherever he goes. And that's the kind of discipleship that Jesus is calling you and me to. We have to say, We'll celebrate our past. Four months ago, okay, there were things that were good, but four months ago was past. We're not a prisoner to it. We'll place things in perspective to help us in the present, to remember His grace, to help us prepare for the next. A God-framed past then gives us the focus to face the next. When Jesus talked, uh, to, was talked to that third person that was enthusiastic but said, I want to I wanna go home and say goodbye to everybody, God was saying, look, you can't have one hand on the plow and keep looking back. Because when you lose your focus, you'll make a crooked path. God doesn't want us to create any crooked paths. He wants us to be focused just like him. At this point in the text, Jesus was had his eyes fixed on Jerusalem, fixed on what he had been called to do. And I wonder, friends of mine, is your gaze fixed on the mission that God has for you? Or do you keep looking back and expecting the past to, to validate our presence? No, no, no. A God-framed past gives us the focus to face the next. I like this quote by William Faulkner. This is what he said. You cannot swim for new horizons until you have the courage to lose sight of the shore. And so we see here the question. Are you willing to leave the shore? I'm pretty sure that you're in the boat but are you hugging the shore because you're afraid of the horizon? Are you afraid of leaving what's comfortable? See, what the shore represents is comfort. What the shore represents is how what we've always done, what we're familiar with. Leaving the shore requires us to leave comfort, to leave what was how it was done before, to leave all these things that were while they were good aren't going to be able to come with us to the next. God has called you and me to get into the boat, but not just to get into the boat. We have to be willing to leave the shore. Well, friends of mine, I can tell you, the only thing that I'm sure of of what's coming next is Jesus returning the second time. I don't know what's going to happen in the next day. I don't know what's going to happen the next month. It seems like 2020 just wants to keep throwing things at us. But for those of us that see things with the eyes of faith, we can't keep looking back for an idealized past that is no longer existing. Let us look at the past. Learn from it. Help us inform our present. Not to paralyze us from moving forward, but to propel us to The next, I'm committing myself today 
not just to get in the boat, but to leave the shore. The horizon, I don't know what it's going to bring, but I know that if God had called me to get into the boat to pursue whatever it was that's coming on the horizon, and that he's in the boat with me, I'm willing to leave the shore. What about you, friend? Are you also paralyzed by looking to the past? Are you, allow- are you allowing your past to keep you prisoner in the present? I want to appeal to you today. Let us remember the past fondly. Let us celebrate it the way that it should be celebrated. But the past is past. Jesus is calling us from comfort. Jesus is calling us to be focused. Jesus is calling us to leave the shore. Is that your desire today? To leave the shore with Jesus to whatever's next. If that's your desire, pray with me this morning. Father in heaven, we are creatures of habit and we've become nostalgic because the present isn't isn't what we want and it wasn't what it was before and we find ourselves or trapped by the past. We're unwilling to try new things. We're unwilling to take that uncertain uh, step of faith forward because we keep one foot in the past and we're hoping that things will go back to the way that was. But Lord, I, I don't want everything to go back to the way that it was. I want, I want you to take me. I want you to take us to the next because we know, Lord, that whatever next is going to be better than our now. And our now is certainly better than it was past. So God, if there is somebody here today that is afraid, I pray, Lord, that you remind them that when they get in that boat, that you are there with them and that they don't have to hug the shore anymore, that they can launch into the unknown because of who we know is in the boat with us. I pray, Lord, for decisions that are being made right now. And if that's you today, tell the Lord right now, God, I want to get in this boat with you, and I want to leave the shore. I pray, Lord, that you bless those decisions right here, right now. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please be sure to continue with us in our series as we begin uh, part three of our sermon series next, next Saturday morning. We hope to see you there and bring a friend. And if this message has been a blessing to you, go ahead and give us a like and share it on your page and invite others to join us on this journey for whatever's next. God bless you.